Welcome to our home. Thank you for attending. Um, the topic tonight, uh, this week my thought will discuss uh, the sacrifices that were brought in the Mishkan, that was also known as the Tabernacle. Um, the Tabernacle was a portable dwelling house, a dwelling, a house of God here on earth. It was constructed by the Israelites after the sin of the golden calf as a sign that God had forgiven them for their transgression. It accompanied the nation while they traveled in the desert before they entered the land of Canaan. Now the third book of the Torah, Vayikra, Leviticus, deals with the sacrifices and the Kohanim, the priests that ministered in the temple. The first portion of the third book dealt with what we call Kol Adat Yisroel, all of the community of Israel. Since they donated their money to build the Mishkan, uh, they are mentioned first in the book. And then in the next portion, in the Seder of Tzav, Aaron and his sons, the priests, are mentioned afterwards. Now the whole book of Ayikra deals with sacrifices that were brought in the tabernacle. It is referred to by the name Torah Kohanim, that the laws, this is the laws of the priests. In the portion of Tzav in the second book of Exodus, and the, the Torah there tells us, about the Korban Tomid, which is the continual burnt offering. Now, it consisted of two sheep that were brought up daily on the altar. One was the first sacrifice offered in the morning, and the other was the last sacrifice that was offered in the afternoon. The commentaries ask, why doesn't the term mention all the sacrifices right there? And they answer because a person might think that God Almighty expects us to sin and that we therefore can't help ourselves. So the Torah doesn't mention a sin offering until after the sin of the golden calf. So initially, <clears throat> the altar was intended only for the carbon tumid, the continual birth offering, and the shlumim offering, the peace offering, which was a means for any individual to express their gratitude to God for his kindness. So the question becomes, what exactly was a shlumim offering? So the word shlomim comes from the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. Now this name is an allusion to the fact <clears throat> that this offering was unlike any of the other sacrifices that were offered. Excuse me. <coughs> there are those offerings that were either totally consumed on the altar, such as an ola, a burnt offering, and those that were partially consumed on the altar, such as a chatos, a sin offering, or an awesome, asham, a, a guilt offering. With the kohanim, the priest partaking of their portion, which consisted of the breast, the jaw, and the right foreleg of the animal that was being offered. The majority of the meat of the shlom and sacrifice was given to the owner uh, with an understanding that it had to be consumed within a period of two days and one night. The only other requirements were that those individuals eating of the sacrifice should be in a state of spiritual purity and that the meat <clears throat> be eaten only within the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Therefore, with this sacrifice, everyone, everyone received a portion. God, the fats, blood, and inner organs that were burned on the altar, the Kohanim, the priests who were given the jaw, the breast, and the right foreleg for their personal consumption, and then the individual who brought the offering would receive the rest of the meat. Now the meat would be consumed in any fashion that would satisfy the owner's own personal customs or desires, as long as the other two requirements were followed. In the portion of Tzav, where the Torah lists all the sacrifice, the last of the sacrifices to be mentioned was the shlumen, the peace offering. Rabbeinu Bachai comments on this and he says, the Torah ends the list of sacrifices with the shlumen, the peace offering, since it brings peace to the world. It is peace which ensures that the universe will continue to exist. Peace is such an important concept that the men of the Great Assembly, the Anshik Nessus Agdola, put the word shalom, peace, at the end of many of our most prestigious prayers. For example, the Amida, the standing prayer, the Kaddish, the praise of God, and, and the benching, the grace after meals. It is also known as one of God's holy names. Now when the Torah mentions the Shlom and sacrifice, the verse reads, 
וזוז תורה זבח השלמים, אשר יקריב להשם. And this is the law of the sacrifice of the peace offering, which may, one may offer before Hashem, before God. Vyukha Rabba points out that the term by Yaakov and Hashem, um, may, one may offer before God, is not used with any other sacrifice. This is the only sacrifice that is brought to God without any obligation by the individual to do so. It therefore brings the giver closer to God Almighty. So the word Yaakov comes from the Hebrew word Korov, meaning closer. The next verse tells us about a very special type of Shlomo sacrifice, which is called a toda, a thanksgiving offering. Rashi states that it would be brought by a person who had experienced a salvation or a miracle, such as an individual who successfully crossed the sea, or one who completed their journey through the desert, someone who had just been released from prison, and finally for an individual who had just recovered from a serious illness. Any one of these four situations would require that the individual involved bring a toda offering. The sacrifice would consist of either a male or female animal. It would be accompanied with four types of meal offerings. Three would be made as matzah, unleavened, and one would be made as chametz, leavened. Each of these four categories consisted of ten loaves. The three types of matzah may well connect to the three matzot, that we place on our table to be used as part of our Passover Seder. One may wonder, why were these four examples used? The Rebbe answers that these four events were situations that the nation had experienced. They had crossed the sea. They had journeyed through the desert. They were freed from the servitude of Egypt. Now, all of these three examples are written in a plural tense. However, the last example, sickness, Rashi writes in the singular. But why? The Rebbe answers that the first three situation, situations were experienced by the entire nation together as one. However, sickness was not something that they had felt as a nation. It was a, a condition that they would have experienced as individuals. Now, the Ben Ishchai writes that these four situations, really, one could think that his salvation came about through some reason other than Yad Hashem, the hand of God. For example, when someone is sick, they can attribute their recovery to excellent doctors or modern technology. One who was freed from prison could credit his freedom to those who interceded on his behalf or the legal prowess of his attorneys. Someone who traveled safely through a desert can feel that, their, that his safe arrival to his destination was the results of all the proper precautions that they employed. And one who crossed the sea might think that their safe arrival was the results of a safer ship or airplane traveling with an airline or cruise line which was known for its excellent safety record. One must be able to see past the obvious and realize that all these are salvations. They are not accidents. They have all been orchestrated by God Almighty for the benefit of each and every individual. All that God wants in return is for us to say toda, thank you. In addition to these four situations mentioned, the Aznaim Latora says that one can bring a toda offering for miracles that occur even though one was not aware of them. When bringing a toda sacrifice, one was obligated to bring a meal offering that consisted of four different types of loaves. Three of them were unleavened loaves, matzah, and four, the fourth was leavened chametz. These correspond to the four types of salvation for which there is an obligation, again, to bring a toda sacrifice. And again, the person who is bringing the sacrifice may only be aware of one miracle. However, the four different types of loaves allude to the possibility that all four kinds of miracles may well have occurred for them. The Islam Torah also states that there, were, that there were ten loaves brought of each type of bread, making up a total of 40 loaves. Now, this number corresponds to the 40 days that it takes to form a fetus in its mother's womb. The person who brings a toad to sacrifice should see themselves as being reborn once again. He also quotes the Talmud in Brachot that states that the ten loaves allude to the necessity for a person 
for whom the miracle was performed, to give thanks before a quorum, a minyan of ten men. Now, even though today we no longer have a temple and therefore can no longer bring any sacrifices, we still perform this rite by what we call benching gomel, which is a ritual whereby we recite a prayer of thanks to God. We do so in the presence of a minyan and a Torah scroll. This ritual is said congregationally so that the congregants can respond with the request that God should continue blessing the party involved with continued goodness and protection. It's an interesting fact that the 40 loaves that accompanied the Torah sacrifice were both chomets and matzah. The Talmud Manacha states that the 10 loaves of chomets weighed exactly the same as the 30 loaves of matzah. Why was there a necessity to offer both chomets and matzah? And not only that, why, why were they equal in weight? Hasidus tells us that the strength of our evil inclination is commensurate to the strength of our good inclination. We are told that chomets, leaven, represents our evil inclination, and that matzah, unleavened, represents our good inclination. Our mission in life is not to destroy our evil inclination, but rather to harness its power into the service of God Almighty. The Torah also differed from a regular shlomim offering, a peace offering, in the time that it was permitted to be eaten. A regular shlomim sacrifice could be eaten for a period of two days and one night, whereas a Torah sacrifice could only be eaten for one day and one night. Now the Ger Rebbe says that this sacrifice was brought for a miracle. Each day that we should appreciate that many, the many miracles that God performs for us. The Osnamal Torah states that there was enough food from the Torah sacrifice to feed 40 adult men. Now, since the time allotted to eat the sacrifice was a day shorter than any other offering, the person bringing the sacrifice would be inclined to make a, a big party and invite family and friends. Once they were all assembled, they would ask him what was the reason for him bringing the Torah sacrifice. Then uh, he would joyfully tell them about all the details of his salvation and the miracles that God Almighty had performed for him. Now this is allusion to the verse we recite three times a day in the Amida, in the standing prayer in the Modim, where we bow and thank God for all of our many daily blessings. We say the words, And I will thank you, and I will tell others about your praises. With these words, the Ansheikh and Nessus Agdola, the men of the Great Assembly, were telling us that it is not enough to just thank God in our hearts for all the kindness that he bestows upon us. It is also necessary to articulate our praises, to tell other people so that they too can appreciate the kindness of God, our Father in heaven. In Tehillim, in Psalm 50, verse 23, it, say, it states, So ve'ach todi yechabedoni. He who offers a thanksgiving offering honors me. The word yechabedoni, honors me, is spelled with an extra Hebrew letter, nun. But why? Our sages tell us that this alludes to the fact that we must give honor and gratitude twice to God. The Ksav Sover states that the individual involved should thank God first for saving him from danger, and then secondly, for putting him into a dangerous situation, which, gave, which gives him the ability to reach out to God with prayer and repentance. As we know, there's no atheist in a foxhole. We also say at the end of the mode in prayer, in every Amida that we recite three times daily, the prayer, B'chol ha'chaim yudu and all living things shall forever thank you. Which is an allusion to the carbon tombet, pardon me, carbon toda. The Hebrew word chayim, life, is an acronym for four life-threatening situations which obligate a person to bring a toda sacrifice. The Hebrew word is spelled chet, yud, another yud, and a mem. The chet is an allusion to a chola, a person who was recovered from a serious illness. The first yod alludes to Yisurim, alluding to a person who has just been released from prison. The second yod alludes to the word Yam, Sea, alluding to an individual who has just crossed a sea safely. And the final mem alludes to Midbar, 
someone who has traveled safely through a desert and had survived. We say that we say the Hebrew word Chaim life, yet these four scenarios really deal with life threatening situations. Death, not life. So this comes to teach us that once someone has been saved from a near death experience, their passion and appreciation appreciation for life increases. They will more often than not live life with even more gusto, and so chaim life. Though often we walk through life like it's a walk through a park. In reality, life is a minefield. The only reason why we are able to survive at all is by the grace of God Almighty. So let us thank him constantly for both the revealed and hidden miracles that he performs for us each and every moment of each and every day. And with that thought in mind, let us look forward to the time when we can thank him for the greatest miracle of all, with the coming of Mashiach Sikainu quickly, and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. May God bless you and yours with safety, health, success, and all that is good. Um, again, uh, Pesach's right, over the corner, right around the corner. If you're a woman, I didn't say it. If it's a man, get ready. And uh, again, a time of joy and redemption. We should look forward to it, hopefully, again, with the coming of Mashiach Sakanum. Again, have a Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for listening.